And hi, everybody. It's good to see um, such a big group here today to talk about COVID data. Let me share my screen. I have, um, I have a presentation here that you guys will get all of these slides. And I want to talk um, kind of generally about COVID, um, about visualizations and also specifically about COVID visualizations. Um, but data visualization is um, can be very tricky um, because as you guys talked about in the last um, session there with Brant, data is complicated, right? Um, there are so many issues that you have to understand with your data set before you can even get to the visualization stage. And there's so much of it and you're really trying to boil it down into a picture that tells a story um, is basically what we're trying to do. So it is complicated, uh, but it's also one of my favorite subjects because I feel like visualization is so important to how journalists communicate to the public. So I want to jump in here. What we're going to cover is the elements of data visualization um, that you really need to know to build a data viz. We're going to talk a little bit about what not to do. Um, we'll take a look at some bad data visualizations and how we can improve those. And then I'm going to show you some of my favorite tools um, that also happen to be free and no programming required that you can build your own data visualizations. So why do we use visualizations? You're making all that information that you're taking, all of those columns and rows that Brant was talking about, and you're making it easier to understand really for yourself and for your audience. Um, it's great to make visualizations to help you understand the story and like you can find where are those COVID spikes happening? What country or what province is doing really poorly right now? Uh, you can put data into context. How are we doing versus other countries or how are we doing versus um, other types of diseases? You can highlight key findings that reinforce your story, really that bring the story home for people. Um, all of the words that you write have a lot of power, but even more so when you put data with those and show people what's happening rather than just telling them. So jumping into some of these elements of data viz, first of all, color. Um, you really want to think about what colors you're putting into your data visualization because colors communicate different things to people. They communicate different feelings. Um, and this can vary by different cultures as well. Like here in the US, red is bad, green is good. Um, and so you want to be careful when you're putting into your visualization that you don't mix those up. Um, you also want to think about accessibility of your visual, visualization. Um, does it work for people who can't see colors very well? In this case, this is an example of uh, a BBC visualization that was just some simple bar charts but they had really three different bar charts. So they used color just to separate them, right? As a visual cue that these are different charts, which I think in this case works really well. So think about the colors that you use, why you're using them and what they communicate to people because color has a lot of um, built-in value itself. All right, the size of your the pieces of your visualization. This is a snapshot of the Johns Hopkins uh, dashboard that you guys took a look at in the last session as well. And it's kind of hard when it's zoomed out this much, but you can see that these um, all of these dots are different sizes. Um, and that tells you it communicates without you really even having to read anything. You know that those larger dots are where there are the most cases it just communicates that to you really inherently. Um, so think about using size in your visualization in that way. It could be size of a bubbles, size of a bar, um, size of different logos, whatever you're using in your visualization, think about what the size communicates. All right, and another one, this one, actually this isn't COVID data, um, but these are data journalism jobs. Um, that one of my colleagues and I analyzed. And the position of these dots tells you so much. This was which media organizations in, uh, in the United States are looking for data the most in their job positions. So who is hiring the most data journalists? And you look at the Center for Public Integrity, they are so far out in front of everyone else 
they have way more mentions of data in their job posts. So they are a really data heavy uh, journalism organization. And it shows in this data. And you can tell like everybody else is kind of, you know, down here um, at the bottom left hand corner, they're all kind of grouped together. But these few organizations that are way out there, that communicates a lot to people that shows they are using data a lot and they are looking for journalists who have data skills. Another way to use position is position on a map, um, which people, if you look at maps, um, people usually can find information very quickly about the place that they live that way. This was um, actually a hurricane that hit Texas here in the United States. And this was um, showing different incidents, um, flooding incidents that had happened in, in Houston and Port Arthur, Beaumont area of Texas. And you can see the positions here. Um, people could use those to look at their own neighborhood, for example. Um, so you can zoom in on this map. Um, it's very interactive. You can zoom in and see like where all these rescue requests were made. And you can also see if you zoom out on the map like we have here, you can see the clusters of them. Like you can see how many people up here in like Northeast Houston needed help um, and how many uh, floods there were and along uh, this lake here. So there's a lot of information packed into this just by looking at the position of the dots. All right, and then the chart type. This might be the most important decision that you make on top of like color, size, um, and all of that. What type of chart are you going to use? And there's just some kind of basic rules about which chart types work best for what kind of data. And this is a line chart, which really works best for data over time. And this is some COVID cases um, in um, like daily cases uh, in the United States. And you can see how it was barely anything until March and there's a huge spike. And the X axis along the bottom is time. So it's really easy for people to tell like, this is how COVID cases are changing over time. We have a lot of different spikes um, here and have gone up over 70,000 cases per day. Um, the y-axis is how many, how many cases per day have been diagnosed. So it really shows you also a lot of information and it's so easy to understand like, and see how this is changing over time. This really tells a story. All right, this one is my favorite. Karen knows this about me. I'm always just advocating for bar chart, bar chart, bar chart. As journalists, um, it's really important for us to know that bar charts are the easiest way for people to understand information to compare. So if you are trying to compare um, the number of cases per country um, or the number of cases, uh, this for example is how much electricity consumption changed during the COVID crisis. Um, so these are all negative bars. And it's so easy to compare here. We don't need fancy like bubbles or anything crazy. It's just so easy to show the bars and you can sort them so they're in order for people. And it's just so easy to tell Italy has the most. Um, it, that's where electricity consumption was cut the most, right? And usually this kind of correlates with economic ac activity as well. So um, you can see like across Europe that electricity consumption has been down um, this year. The pie chart, or in this case, these are donut charts technically because they have the whole cut out of them. So they look like little donuts. Um, the pie chart is probably the most controversial chart in journalism. Um, this is a way, if you want to start an argument between data journalists, ask them how they feel about pie charts. Um, pie charts can be, I would say, I'm not totally against them, but use them sparingly. And what they are used for is to show pieces of the whole. So really a bar chart or a pie chart should always add up to 100%. And you'll see in this case, they do like 73 plus 17 plus 10. That is um, the total 100% of students that were um, surveyed here. These charts show effect on 
mobility um, of students and in international students in between countries. And so you'll see like in the on the left that's outbound whether they were leaving this country and 73% had some impact and 17% had none and 10% were not sure. So out of the whole um, of all the students that they surveyed, that's what they have. Could these also be bar charts? Absolutely. Um, it's usually easier for people to compare that way. Um, in this case, I would say if you are using pie charts, always put the number actually on there so that people can tell the difference. Like on this pie chart on the right, or this donut chart, if the numbers 20 and 26 weren't here, it would be pretty difficult really for your eye to tell the difference between those. You could kind of see like the orange ones a little bit bigger. But you don't know how much bigger and it's just, it just kind of makes things a little fuzzier, just a little harder to pull out the information. And remember that your audience does not have time to worry about pulling information, right? They need to get what information you are trying to tell them very quickly out of your visualization. So always think about that. Always think about your user and what they're going to get out of it. So pie chart is, um, I would say, use it sparingly, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't outlaw it completely. If you do use it, always, always make sure it adds up to 100%. A timeline, another one of my favorites. A timeline is, um, this is kind of a simple timeline that shows all of the stay at home orders here in the United States by state. So on this timeline from March 18th through April 7th, which states had orders, um, which most of them did here, um, not all of them. And it's just a really simple way, like if you were reading this in a story, gosh, it would take paragraphs and paragraphs to explain. Like, well, California was, um, was first on the 19th of March and you just keep going, right? But this shows it in one nice neat graph. I can find my state very easily. We were March 30th, I live in Kansas. So you can look and find the information that you need and you can find very quickly um, all of the other states. You can tell who was late, who was early. Lots of information that you can glean from this that would take just so many words to write. Um, and we're gonna take a look here um, at the tools when I get to those of a really cool interactive timeline tool that you can add photos, videos, and lots of interactive elements for people. I feel like a timeline is one of the absolute best ways to tell a really complicated story like COVID is. It is just, there's so many different elements from health, economy, um, politics, and there's just so much going on with it. And timelines really help people, they help me too <laughs> as a journalist, really just keep the story straight. What happened when, um, and so like maybe these other events caused others, you can just get so much information from a timeline. I'm a huge fan of them. All right, and maps. Uh, maps are also a really great tool, um, especially if you're wanting people to find information about their own city, state, country, um, whatever it is. This is actually a screenshot of a map. We'll take a look a little more in depth at this. But these are COVID cases um, by country in the Caribbean. And one really, really important point I want to make about this map um, before we move on and any data um, analysis or visualization is this uses the, the rate of cases, um, not the raw number of cases per country. Um, if you make a map that is just like the raw number of cases, you are probably most likely just going to make a population map, right? The largest countries have the most number of cases. Um, and so in this case, we did a rate of how many cases there were per 50,000 residents. And then we mapped that so that you can see the spots that really have high rates within their population. So Panama is the darkest here. And so that shows that they are, they have the highest rate. So always think about whether you are showing valid data in your visualizations as well. The rate, if you are comparing countries, you really have to look at rates. 
All right, this is my number one guiding rule in visualizations. Keep it simple. The simplest, the better. Less is more. And we're going to take a look here to, in a um, little video to show you how you can take a chart that is trying to show something simple, but they overcomplicate it and how they can bring it down to something simple. I always, um, my rule to kind of help me keep things simple when, especially when I was learning data visualization in the newsroom, um, I would tend to overcomplicate things. I want to tell the whole story, show everything to everyone. And that's really not the best way to do it. You want to keep a focus on the story that you're trying to tell, show people what they need to know and show it quickly. And so I would take my visualizations and show them to someone else in my newsroom who didn't know the story that I was working on. And I would watch them try to understand my visualization. And if they had to ask me any questions or if they couldn't figure it out or took too long to figure it out, I went back to the drawing board and tried to make it even more simple because that's called user testing basically is what I was doing, but using my colleagues as my testers. I don't want my audience to have to work very hard at all. So if you remember one thing about this, keep it simple. All right, I'm gonna play this uh, little video on the next slide here. Watch what they do to improve this visualization. All right, so yeah, the next slide we have a before and after here. So which one, uh, which one do you guys like better here? The one on the left or the one on the right? Let me get my chat box up here. Yeah, all right, I see, uh, I see at least one vote for the one on the left. Maybe the different colors add more interest. Um, but yeah, the right is just, it's just easier to understand. And this was a story about bacon. We all love bacon. So they highlighted bacon in there and they're trying to compare the calories and that's all I need, right? Um, simple, plain, using color to pop out bacon because that's a story and, and it's done, right? Um, so, Think about the, what this, the one on the left, um, a lot of visualization experts call this chart junk, <laughs> um, that there's just so many words. Um, there's a key that you don't need. There's a, a background that you don't need. Even really like the lines, you don't necessarily need those. Um, and in this case, like the labels because they put the labels directly on there. Um, yeah, so it doesn't make you look at the key. You get the information in a split second. So think about what your visualization is saying and how you can make it, um, how you can make it simpler. Got another example here, pie charts. Remember they are the uh, ultimate controversy in journalism data viz. It takes me a minute, but I can kind of break this one down, right? Um, this is, travel market size, so like contribution to uh, GDP. Europe, well on the left we have 2000 and then we have 2016. So on the left you can clearly see that Europe is the largest one, followed by North America and then Asian Pacific. Um, on the right, the breakdown changes, right? The share grew for Asia Pacific. Um, and then Europe looks like it's number two. North America is right there. They're basically very similar. Um, but I have to, like talking that out is kind of what I have to do in my head. I have to really think it through and think about it. Um, so best way to compare, remember, is a bar chart. <laughs> 
And in this case, it's the same exact data, just shown in a different way so that you can compare the bars very easily. And you can see each area, each continent side by side. So you can see what Europe went to 35% to 27%. And then the bar that is the highest in each year, they, they made it a little darker. So you can see this one is the biggest. So they used some color, they used the bar chart and the labels in the middle to make it a lot easier. Side by side bar charts. Um, to me, this one is also much more pleasant and like quick to get that, um, to get the data that I need out of it. So two different ways to show the same data, but one way is just much quicker and easier on your audience. Okay, so now it's you guys' turn. You guys can use the chat or you can, um, you can uh, unmute and speak as well if you would like to. Here are some charts that I feel like these could use some improvement. And there's no like super right or wrong answers here, but go ahead and um, let me know what you might do with this chart. This is um, companies that consider employee retention a major concern over time. So going from 2009 to 2018, and we have a series of donut charts. The darker color is the companies that are concerned. And the lighter color is the companies that are not concerned about retention. Any thoughts, Marsha? Yeah, do a line chart. That's a great idea, right? Because this is data over time. And so if you take that 28%, 20%, 47%, et cetera, and just make a line, that shows how many companies are concerned. And you can very quickly and easily see how it changed over time. In this one, my eye has to really struggle and my brain has to compute basically, okay, this year, did it go up or down? Like what was the change? Yeah, and Gabby's agreeing. I, I agree with you guys too. A line chart just with one line showing retention would, would do the trick here. They were overcomplicating what this needed to be. On a side note, I'm not sure, it looks like the center of the donut also moves every year and I'm not sure why it does that, <laughs> but that, that also bothers me, <laughs> this chart. All right, now this is a, a COVID pie chart um, from the state of Oklahoma here in the States. And they are showing the breakdown of cases by race and ethnicity. And this is a, um, it is a pie chart again. And it, as a little hint, it might require some math to, to show what's wrong with this chart and how it might be improved. Might take a little math. What do you guys think? Any ideas? Yeah, Marsha is saying a bar chart. I almost always say bar chart too. <laughs> if you want to make me happy, um, tell me to make a bar chart. Um, yeah, and Kimberly is saying uh, it doesn't match up to 100%. That's exactly right. Um, it adds up to, Gabby did the math it looks like, um, it adds up to 92% that is in this bar chart. Now, I honestly, don't understand the math of this. I'm not sure because they say in the top there, like in the title, that 13.5 did not report race and 16.9 did not report ethnicity. And I could not get anything to add up to 100% in here at all. <laughs> um, and so I was very confused about everything. Um, so 
if you are going to make a pie chart, it does need to add up to 100%. So if you need to put like did not report or unknown as a piece of the pie to make it add up to 100, you can do that. Um, but then I also agree with a couple of you now have said make a bar chart. Make a bar chart. It's just so much easier for people to see the bars. And then you can do the direct labels as well. So you don't have to use the key and keep looking back and forth. Um, so fix your math and do a bar chart um, on this, I think would be my, my preferred way to show these cases as well. Yeah. Yeah, looking at about, yeah, 90, 92, almost 92% in this bar chart, which the pie is 100%. This happens, by the way, all the time. I can't tell you how many pie charts I see that don't add up to 100%. And it's just so confusing. It, it doesn't make any sense at all. So please be careful. Yeah, right. Um, and that's what I tried to do, Leighton. It was trying to add those percentages on top, but I couldn't get anything to add to 100% um, because 13.5 and 16.9 is like 30%. Um, and so I'm just not sure. Um, <laughs> I, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with like the difference between race and ethnicity and there's a lot of like definitions going on here. Um, so yeah, but the, yeah, right. And Andrew is saying like sometimes there's um, almost always an other or an unknown. That's absolutely true, but it's not really accounted for in the chart. So um you got to make sure you do that and if there are really kind of weird blurred lines like this with like what is race what is ethnicity um like for example hispanic or latino can be any race it does say that here um you need to really kind of explain that a bit more like this could probably use like a a little line with stating what, you know, what each of these mean or what, like what those definitions are between like race and ethnicity, for example. It's not as clear cut as this chart makes it seem. But Denise, one of the things that, that strikes me though, um, Kieran here, is that they say that 13.5 did not report race and 16.9 did not report ethnicity. So why include them at all? Because wouldn't that, um, you know, create some confusion when the sample size, you know, is weighted. Why, why include them at all? Maybe that this, it's flawed. Right. Yeah. Um, well, we don't know the sample size, the total sample size actually out of this chart. Um, we only know that they're trying to break down whatever that sample size is. Um, and in a pie chart like this, when you don't include the full amount, like when you don't include 100%, like in this case, they should have included an unknown. What you're doing is giving an, a, a skewed picture of what, what data they do have, right? Like this, the 69.6%, .6%, it looks like over three quarters of the pie visually because their pie is off. Their pie is only like 92% of a pie when it really should be 100%. So they're giving you a skewed visual picture of the data that they do have. Does that make sense? Yeah, so shouldn't they have just omitted it rather than confusing the public, omit, omit the people who didn't, you didn't have a proper response for? Um, in the data well, aspect. Well, it's quite a large unknown percent. Um, and so when you don't know, like around 15 to 20% of your data, it really means like there's a large margin of error in these other ones. Like 69% white could be 80% white, you know, or 85% white if we knew some of those unknowns. And so it is important to tell people how many are unknown. So it is that why they would yeah. not have used unknown in, in this instance? Because clearly they didn't know what they were about and the actual figures. Right. I would have used, yeah, unknown or did not report something to tell people like, here's how many I don't know. It, it is very important to tell people how much you don't know, just as much as, as it is important to tell people what you do know. 
because these numbers could really be completely different if we knew the race and ethnicity for for everyone. These numbers could be totally different. And then also something that I'm noticing, um, the color scheme, it's so it's so blended that it could be easily misrepresented. Yeah, I think that that's a really great point too, um, especially for people who don't see color very well or might be colorblind, like the greens and the blues, um, especially I feel like kind of really blend together. That's a really great point. Yeah. So yeah, it's, I mean, it looks like a simple pie chart, but when you start thinking critically about it, there's a lot of issues with it. Um, so I encourage you guys to actually do this and practice whenever you see visualizations or whenever you see data from a government organization, from a news organization, think critically about it. Um, think about like how, what might be wrong with this and how might I have done this better? It's a really great exercise to think about how you build your own visualizations. All right, yeah, anything else on, on this one? Great, I have, um, I have a couple more here. Um, I do want to, you guys can look at these, you guys will get these slides. You can look at these on your own time um, as well. This one's just kind of crazy. Um, you can't tell where the lines are going, <laughs> really. You can't, they get all lost in each other. Um, so maybe some color to differentiate between the lines would be great for this one. Um, and this one, gosh, yeah, I don't even really know where to start. Um, but there's so much going on with these donut charts that don't make any sense. Like they're just numbers. They're not percentages of anything. Um, and then you don't really need to use the icons for male and female. Those are just bars really. Um, but it looks like you have like 62% of a man and 38% of a woman here, which just kind of looks weird. So this one, yeah. <laughs> Kern, Kern, you like this one, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, it could be so much simpler and so much easier to understand. So don't, don't do this one. All right. Um, I want to jump now. I know we're um, a little pressed for time. So I want to talk about some of my favorite tools. Um, yeah, and Lizelle is asking, what are some of the best applications or tools to, to represent data? That is exactly what we're getting into now. Um, and I, I can tell you guys, there are so, so, so many data visualization tools out there that you could like spend your whole careers just like learning new tools. Um, so I want to really show you just my favorite couple of tools. I think I, I have three of them here for you that are good for different situations. They are all free, which is the best part. And once you learn them, they can do pretty much anything for you. Um, and again, free, no programming required, open source, you can publish them. They are interactive. Uh, so let's jump into Tableau is um, probably my absolute favorite uh, visualization tool you can download it for free and Tableau was was built as a tool for businesses to build these dashboards. I'm going to show you just really quickly here in the gallery. Look at these dashboards that people build with this free tool. You can do so much. Um, you can do so many complicated things with it, but you can also do so many simple things with it. Um, and we have been using Tableau a lot with uh, the Media Institute and building different maps. Uh, bar charts, line charts, and I'll, sh I'll show you some examples of that as well. Look at this crazy chart showing economic output of U.S. counties with little spikes on every county. How cool is that? And this can do it without any programming at all. So you can download Tableau Public, and again, it was meant for businesses, but they put out this free version for journalists because they really want to help journalists communicate with the public. And this is a, an example of a, a fairly simple chart here. Let me click on it so I can show you the, um, the interactivity here. This is, you know, that uh, drug prices are a huge problem here in the United States. And this is looking at the EpiPen, which is for people who, who have 
severe food allergies, this saves their lives. And the price of an EpiPen now in the United States is up to over $600. Um, this was from 2016. I think it's um, way more than that now. Like th these prices just keep going up. It's crazy. And this chart, this is all you need. Line chart showing the price of EpiPen. And in this case, they wanted to show several different drugs. And instead of complicating their chart with a bunch of different lines, they just made different charts that you can flip through here with these tabs, which I thought was really smart. Um, so I can go quickly to um, actually Synthroid. I'm on Synthroid. It's a thyroid drug if you have a uh, low thyroid. So I can click over to that if that's what I'm interested in and just get that answer. Um, super easy, right? And that way um, I get the information I need and I don't have to mess with the rest of them. When you have a line chart and you have more than just a couple lines, it starts to get pretty complicated. So I liked their decision here to just keep it simple, separate each drug, and people can look at what they're interested in. This is a COVID map from in Missouri where IRE is based. And this is a little old here. I think it was from a couple months ago. You can see where the cases are getting bad. We can go to, I'm going to go to it live here so we can see Saline County here. Um, and some of these like central Missouri uh, counties are getting to be a little bit worse. Um, this is, yeah, as of April here. Um, but I love this Tableau does this um, automatically and you can format this in any way you want, but you see how I'm hovering over the counties and it pops up and tells me all of the details about that county. So I use the map and the colors in the map to look at where the hot spots are. And then when I hover over those counties, I get really detailed information like St. Louis County where St. Louis is. They have a really high rate and they have, and this was only as of April, they had 97 deaths already just in that one county. So such a great visualization where I can dig into data. I can get a broad picture and dig in into different counties um, or different pieces of the visualization. And I love that. I also love how she put, this is, this was built by a student, by the way, at the University of Missouri. I love how she put um, this total positive number here on there too, so I can get that very quickly. She has some uh, caveats here. Let me make this a little bigger so we can read them. You know, a little asterisk here with um, the total includes uh, a case where there, we don't know the county yet. And etc. Some of the cities are in different counties, so they, she accounted for that. And then this is also really, really important. The source here, always, always make sure that you put a source on your data visualization. You want people to understand where you got that information, um, that you got it from the government, from a nonprofit organization, or from uh, that you pulled together different data from different places. Like you need to list the sources so that people trust your visualization, right? Um, and that is really, really important. And probably one of the, the things that people forget most when they start out building, uh, building data visualizations. Let me get to, this one is one of my favorite data visualizations. Um, here at IRE, we do data consulting work. Um, and one of my colleagues built this for a, a Media Institute of the Caribbean project. So looking at, and I have it uh, blown up a little here. There, this makes it a little easier. This is looking at cases in the Caribbean. And this is, I did that screenshot earlier. So we talked about the case rates here. So I can scroll over it and there's a great um, data point here. So in Panama, which has a population of 3.8 million, 3.9 almost, they have had at least 120,000 positive cases since March 10th. And their case rate is uh, 1,545 per 50,000 residents. So when you scroll over your country and you get that full context of what's going on, it's really powerful. Again, you can see that big picture, so you can see which 
countries are doing relatively well or relatively poorly. And then you get like a lot of details about each country and you can kind of scroll through them here. Really powerful. And then the line chart on the right is the seven day rolling average of new cases, which shows you um, and this right now we're looking at the whole Caribbean, so we're looking at all of these countries. Um, and this really shows you the overall picture of how things are going. My favorite thing about this visualization is that you can actually um, use a filter here, and this is all things that you can build very easily with Tableau to choose. Um, let's choose just um, the Dominican Republic, for example, and it'll take a second here. And now it is zoomed in only on the Dominican Republic. And so I see the map zoomed in. I can look at the information there. And then I can also see how cases are going there. And like without all the other countries, now I have a zoomed in picture and I can tell like actually, you know, it looks like their average case is a little bumpy, but it's down from an overall high. So I can look at all the different countries that are in this visualization and compare really quickly um, for what I need. Really, really cool visualization and so much information in here, but they're simple visualizations, right? You don't have to go crazy. It's a map and a line chart and it tells me so, so much. And this was built off of Johns Hopkins data, by the way, um, and stays updated. Um, we, for a little bit of the back end look, we run this off of Google Sheets. Um, and when you attach it to a Google Sheet that updates, this visualization will update automatically as well. So it's really uh, a handy tool. Yeah, and Karen is giving you guys the, the link there for the, the full um, project that they did on this. This was another um, project that we did with the Media Institute um, and the Caribbean Institute uh, uh, Investigative Journalism Network. And this was Chinese backed projects around the Caribbean. So we have kind of similar with a map, but I wanted to show you guys this as well because it has a data table here at the bottom. And you can use these filters to look at the country or the type of project. And then the table down here will give you all of the full information. We hadn't really talked yet about data tables, so I did want to point, point that out. All right, so Tableau, um, I'm going to give you guys some resources to learn Tableau if you would like to. Um, for now, I want to show you Timeline JS, which is one of my favorite visualization tools for showing timelines and making them really cool and visual and interactive. This is, um, I couldn't really find a, a COVID. Oh, here's the link. I couldn't really find a COVID timeline yet um, from what people have, but this is um, also a really interesting timeline that shows how the Islamic State expanded. And this is all built without any programming again. Um, that's still loading. Let me find another one. See how you can scroll through the timeline here to different events. This is all, it's all also built on a Google Sheet. Um, and I'll show you that in a sec. And you can put in videos, you can put in audio, photos, uh, website links, all of these different multimedia. Um, here, like here's a video, for example. All of these different multimedia um, elements that make your timeline really interesting and rich for people to scroll through. So you can see the, how this story unfolded and you can dig into each event in the timeline as well. So that is just one example of a timeline. And if you go to this um, link here, timeline.nightlab.com, and if you click on make a timeline, it will give you, this is the spreadsheet template. It is just a Google Doc. Google Sheets document. And it's a template that is really easy to put together. So you put in like the year, month, day, and time of the event. And if it lasted, um, 
even like a month or years or whatever, you put the start time and the end time. You put a headline and some text, and then this is where you can add the multimedia. So add videos, add photos, or whatever. Um, and you can make these um, different types, like a title. You can add different background colors, and that's really it. Um, and then you put it back into, um, to publish to the web, you have to publish your Google Sheet. And then you put the, the link here into the timeline website and it will spit out a embeddable um, code for you. And that's it. Like it's super, super simple and easy and a lot of fun. I really love um, the timelines that you can build here. And then the final one that I'll show you guys um, is Flourish which is also free for journalists. You have to set up, um, set it up for your newsroom. And you can build really cool visualizations that I, I feel like the strength of Flourish is animated visualizations like this. Um, so it is all also built off of templates. So it will tell you here are all the columns that you need to have and you can copy and paste your data into it and it will make these visualizations. So let me show you a couple examples here. This is a, it's basically kind of a timeline map of COVID cases around the world over time. So watch how they all just pop up around the world. There's China popping up. Now you see Europe and the United States and how it's all just growing over time. So at the end of it, we're in October and we're at 36.5 million confirmed cases. Just really shows people like how it starts to pop up here and there and these little hot spots, and then boom, explodes around the world. And we can go back here. All right, there's one more, um, there's tons of different charts you can use in Flourish, but this one is one of my favorites. It's called a bar chart race. So watch, this is, the date is changing over time. And you see COVID, the red bar there. And it's becoming the, when you see it jump up to the top there, that means um, it is the biggest, um, the, the largest cause of death in the United States. So it became that in April. And it's, these are so cool. I'll, I'll play it real, again so you can watch it since it's pretty quick. But I love this type of chart because it's really interactive and it shows people, like the bar chart is comparing things, but it's also comparing it over time, right? Because it plays this animation. So you can see COVID leapfrogging to the largest, be the, you know, the highest cause of death in the United States, which is pretty crazy. It did that within just um, a month, basically, um, from, from having the first death here. So it really, really tells um, quite the story when you look at the data this way. And that is Flourish. Um, again, that's at flourish.studio and it is also free. And it will um, kind of walk you through how to build a template of each different type of chart. And there are many, many other types of charts that Flourish does as well. So those are my really top three visualization tools right now. There are many others, Brant um, mentioned Data Wrapper, which is also excellent. And there are many, many others. I really focused on these three because I feel like if you learn these, you can do pretty much anything. Um, so I want to uh, save a little time for questions. I also brought a few other resources for you guys. Um, and again, you'll get these slides, so you will have all of these. We just a couple weeks ago had our um, big international conference, um, our IRE 20 conference, virtually, of course. And these were the slides from accessing international COVID data um, from that session. 
So I wanted to give you guys these. There are some really good tips in here um, from these different organizations um, and finding, finding data on many different countries. I also brought this, um, this is one of the tip sheets that uh, my colleague Charles Minshew made. He made that um, really amazing Caribbean COVID map and line chart that I showed you. And this tip sheet has ha tips on like actually how to access the data with links and different um, like formulas that you would need. Like I mentioned that you really have to find the rate. This is how you find the rate. Um, so he has formulas and how to find that rolling seven day average and things like that that you might need in here. And then I also have a link here for if you want to learn Tableau, all of our boot camps are online right now. So it really is a great time to do this um, without having to travel. And we have a two day visualization workshop using Tableau coming up in uh, the beginning of February. So if you guys are interested in that, there is a link here to that as well. So now this is my email and please feel free to get in touch at any time. Um, you can hear my cat telling me that it is time, uh, time to take questions now um, as we wrap up here. So a couple um, questions here. Lizelle is asking, does Flourish have a downloadable button to share it online? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's really for, um, let me see here. Yeah, here's an, um, the embed code that you get um, once you build one and make it public, make it publishable. You will get an embed code. So it's like a um, little chunk of HTML that you can embed into your story. And there's different options here of like, you can make it an iframe um, and things like that. You can also share it like on Twitter, for example, it will give you a link that like links back to this visualization, um, for example. So yes, it is uh, a really cool tool that has um, you can embed and all of those all of those things. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, Zarn is saying you made a um, very detailed timeline of COVID. That is awesome. I would also love to see that too. Um, that would be very cool to see. All right, I know that was a super quick overview of uh, visualization and then um, looking at COVID as well. Does anybody else have any questions or, or thoughts? Guys, the floor is open to you now. Any questions, any comments? Um, LaSalle Benjamin from Isaac 98.1 FM, uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I want to know in terms of the learning curve, because I know for a lot of these um, open source, these, um, mm -hmm. you know, software, there's a steep learning curve. Could you tell me about that? Yeah, what a great question. Um, some of, some of these do have some pretty steep learning curves. Um, I would say probably that Timeline and Flourish are the easiest to learn because they work off of templates that are pretty easy to pop your data into and build exactly what you're looking for, build, build what you want. Um, Tableau has a much steeper learning curve However, you're also going to be able to do more with it. You can do a lot more, um, it's a lot more flexible and a lot more um, customizable. So like all of these visualizations that people are making here really only are possible with Tableau unless you learn programming or something. Um, it's just a lot more flexible. So I would recommend if you can't make it to our boot camp, there are also these free resources here. If you go to that that link from Tableau Public that I um, gave you guys, when you go to resources, there is this list of I think it's about twenty videos, and they're all really short. They're not all like an hour or anything. They're just a few minutes, and you can download the data that goes with it, and it walks you through building a really cool map 
um, interactive map of uh, CO2 emissions around the world, so the carbon dioxide emissions, and it's a great way to learn. And each video kind of walks you through one particular skill. So you can also, you know, I only need maybe, let's say the first five or six videos to really build something, and then you can start learning more as you go through it. So um, you don't have to even do all 20 videos at once. So I really recommend these videos, like download the data, walk through it together with them, and you will learn a lot that way. Um, and once you start building visualizations, I would also recommend start very small and start very simple. So, you know, build, build yourself a bar chart um, that works really well. And then like next time, maybe build a line chart, you know, build just what you need before you start building really complicated, like big visualizations. Um, and that will really like help you learn as you go because you don't have to learn. I don't, I've been using Tableau for 10 years now actually, and I don't know the whole tool. It's, it's just, there's a lot to learn, but don't overwhelm yourself with trying to learn the whole thing, right? Learn the piece that you need, make that piece, and then, uh, and then move on um, to the next thing when you need um, to learn that type of chart, right? So don't overwhelm yourself with learning everything at once. Also, my cat is here to say hello to everyone. <laughs> you could hear my cat yelling. He always likes to see my video. Any, any more questions? <laughs> Before we close off. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, Jermaine Abel from Synkits. Hi, Jermaine. Yes. Uh, uh, one question, but it, this is also goes back to the presentation that Brant made. But the, mm -hmm. the question is, how do you factor in when you're doing this, these charts, um, the, the information coming out from the backlog of cases because yes. um, because the, 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 this is an actual example in that it was found out by a, a good colleague of mine that he tested positive for COVID-19 but this was just about a month after so we're not getting that data a month later so how do you factor in all of this into these charts when you're 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 basically way behind that is such a great question and such a huge problem with COVID data in general that's happening everywhere um that maybe they'll get uh maybe just for example here like it, on this chart maybe the spike these cases were actually in july some of them uh, but they're only just reporting them so some places some government agencies that are releasing data have started to backdate those cases so there might be a reported date and a testing date like that testing date uh, if you have that would be the one to visualize instead of the reported date so that you could see like when the person was actually positive and if you are updating your chart um, the previous dates might change, right? Um, because cases are added to those times. Um, if your agency is not doing that, like if they're not giving you the actual tested date, um, it's something that you have to ask them about. And especially if you see a giant spike, be sure to ask like, was this a data dump of old cases basically? Um, that's kind of what you can ask them because that's happening a lot. You'll see stories that are reporting like frantic, um, horrible numbers, you know, like, oh my God, these numbers are increasing. There was a huge spike today. And then it's reported that way. But then the reporter has to come back and say like, oh, sorry to scare you. Like this was just a data dump of everything from the last month or whatever. So if you see a big spike before reporting it, make sure to ask them like, was there a data dump on this date? Do you have the actual dates of these cases? Like when they were actually tested? Because that's what you need to visualize. Um, the, the seven day average that we used here can help even some of those things out because you're looking more at like the average over the last seven days instead of 
day by day, but it doesn't, it doesn't really um, take ever, take all of that out. You know, it's, it's still like, if you have a big spike from cases from previous days, like that's a big problem. But, so, yeah. Try to get the a, actual tested dates if you can. Just a follow up to that. Uh -huh. with, with, with that data now and you're, would have fully recovered because the person did 14 days, well, came back a month later, they were mm -hmm. asymptomatic and all of that. How do you now accurately picture this? Because in the government's date, it's going to show, um, let's say we're in October now for September, mm -hmm. maybe 10,000 cases. But then now in October, you're going to see that's 10,001 because that person's information will come up yeah. now, but that does not accurately show what is actually transpiring. So, so, so the, the question is now, is, can we say that this information is actually misleading the, the, the general public? And it's, it's also raising concerns that we're not actually getting the true picture as well as we're losing people and, and people are falling through the cracks. Yeah, that's a great question too. You're, you're talking about several different measures, like several different ways that we look at cases. And they're all, I would say that they're all valid ways to look at it, but you have to kind of give people that whole picture and give it to them differently and make sure they understand. Like what we're looking at here, what we used for this visualization was average new cases per day. So this is like how many cases are actually diagnosed each day, which gives you a picture of how much the, um, how much the virus is spreading, right? Um, when you see these spikes, like there's a lot of spread in the community. So that's what this tells you. Um, the, the numbers that you were kind of talking about there were like, how do we know how many active cases there are in the community? which is just a different measure, right? How many people are actually sick today? This average of new cases doesn't tell you that. And the cumulative total cases also doesn't tell you that. So that's a different measure. And if your agency gives you that, um, I, would, I think that's a great thing to give to people too. It's a great way to look at, like here's how many new cases we had today. Here's how many cases are actually active. Um, and then really kind of the third way is how many cumulative cases we have had since the beginning of this thing. Those are all three separate ways to look at the data. They're separate measures, but I think they are all important to people. They all tell you something different, right? Um, but you just have to be careful that you tell people exactly what number they are looking at. I also think that the, yeah. the active cases is something that's really kind of all of these are difficult to pin down, right? <laughs> They're all like, it depends on how well you're testing, the accuracy of the tests that you have, but active cases are especially difficult because even if it's been 14 days, sometimes a person's not recovered, you know? So are they counting them as recovered and they're not? It, there's a lot of um, variability and like fuzziness in these numbers as well. And I think it's up to journalists to communicate that. Um, that these numbers are not black and white. They are not hard and fast. Right? They are kind of, they're the best we have to tell people what's going on, but they are not 100% accurate. They're just not. That just doesn't mean they're just yeah, Denise, if I can just chime in, because I like yeah. the, um, the fact that you raise of the variability issue. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this was behind one of questions earlier on it, during my session and um, I think if we still have the statistician there um, she can explain the difficulty especially with the COVID-19 issue because we're also using different different definitions so when you speak about recovered um, it, it, it takes on one meaning Brand gave us a, an example somewhere in the states where um, recovered meant that the person didn't die within a certain period of time or whatever. We need to be very clear when we're reporting these issues. Now, I don't think that it is always a function of officialdom misleading people. I think it is for us to inter it's it's our interpretation, because one of the things we need to be cautious about here 
and, and I'm glad we might still have a statistician on board, is that um, there are figures that need to be statistically significant in order for us to, to, to add them to a cohesive data set in order for us to, to indicate trends, which is, I think trends is, is, is as, important, as important as the absolute figures because it can tell you whether the trend is tending towards more or fewer. And that is even more important than if you had a, a, a bundling of, um, because of testing issues. Here we, in Trinidad, an issue, not with the testing per se, but the reporting. So there was one agency doing the testing and another doing the reporting. And because of staff and other issues, the the reporting figures came sometimes up to five, six, seven days later. Now it's far more current, but um, I think that there are a lot of variabilities and that what we need to do is to be clear when we are reporting the figures, what those variabilities are and, and how they are represented via the figures that we are reporting on. Yes, absolutely. I could not agree more. That was very well said. And no data set is perfect um, at all. So anytime you're reporting on data, you need to be upfront about what you know and what you don't know and what the limitations are. But COVID data is especially bad about this. And it doesn't mean that you can't use it. Um, but I think, as Wesley said, looking at trends uh, more than actual specific numbers and also just being absolutely upfront about why something might not be entirely accurate or um, why you're using one measure over another measure or whatever it might be. Um, or if you have to go back and correct previous numbers because there was a big data dump, like you have to do that kind of stuff to build trust in, in your reporting. And it's just, it's just the nature of the situation. Things are changing so fast. The science is changing so fast from what we understand of this virus as well. So it's just kind of the, the nature of the beast with it. Um, and don't be afraid to tell people limitations of this data because there are a lot of them. There are a lot. 